Destiny, Out of the Wild, a novella by J.A. Parry Bruce. Chapter 5 Something tells me this isn't just a hunt. Light, quiet gear won't be enough for this. Back in the workshop, dressed in light underclothes, I throw on a pair of thick, padded trousers, a shirt with thin stripes of armour between its layers, and my waistcoat. I put aside my light, comfortable moccasins and pull on a pair of thick, heavy boots, tie the belt with its pouches around my waist. I find a pair of gloves, armoured knuckles and fingertips, strap on a pair of braces and knee guards scavenged from the fallen. Over it all, I throw my father's coat. The bone is still in the pocket near my breast. I take it out for a moment, rub my thumb over the thanks sign, put it back. I get the feeling we might not be coming back here. Pack up my belongings. I've still got the ghost. I put it in the pouch at the small of my back, still warm. As I lean forwards to pick up my rifle, I feel the hard edge of Gamma's parting gift, still wrapped up, in another pocket. I'll open it when we're done, I promise myself. Feels like that might be the right time. I throw my rifle over my shoulder and secure it at my hip, slide my knife into the sheath of my thigh. For some reason, I feel more like myself than I have done since I left the underground, despite everything that's happened in the last 24 hours. As I'm leaving, I catch sight of my reflection in a darkened window, the glass still intact. I'm thinner than when I left, harder. My face is much as it was, pretty but not beautiful. Dirt streaks at my cheeks. There are clean patches where I've wiped away tears. I've not had time to wash properly since we returned. My hair has grown. I remember Mama brushing it when I was younger. I miss her. I remember Rico pulling it when we fought. I miss him. I remember Gamma stroking it as she told me stories by the fire. I miss them all. But I have to protect them. That's who I am now, I think. I live for them. I draw my knife, gather my hair at the nape of my neck, place a blade under it, saw and pull. It hurts a little. A brief jerk of the knife and the last few strands give out. The shortened sides tickle my cheeks. I can feel the ward at my neck more clearly now. I find I can't throw the handful of hair away. I take up a pinch in the thumb and forefinger, tie it into a ribbon, place it deep inside a pocket of my coat. The rest I leave on a box. Someone might have use for it. I'm ready. The others must have sensed the need for action too. They're all dressed like me. Very unlike hunters. Boots, heavy coats and jackets, armour, weapons. When I joined them in the common room, Lycus was handing out handguns. A precaution, he said. Just in case. I saw several of the boxes lying open on the ground. Everyone was refilling their magazines, belts and bandoilers. Liam had a fallen weapon, as did Pilo and Jenna. Buras had his own gun, a revolver that I'd seen him cleaning from time to time. Lana was carefully examining an old pistol. Ryman was quietly explaining the use of a new side armor to Seb, using his own as an example. As I entered, Lycus pressed the last fallen gun into my hands. It's much like our pistols, but bigger. Grip, trigger, hammer, barrel, check. I held it out to test it. It's heavy, but I find I could bear the weight quite well. It's old, I think, older than me. It's been repaired and refurbished. Spines along the back. One has broken off. Pillow helped me fashion a sling for it, and I tuck it under my coat, next to my left leg. It swings gently as we walk, making itself known with a persistent tapping. Before we left, Lycus opened a long box I'd seen him carry around from station to station, but never open. 
Inside was a rifle, longer than any I'd ever seen, and strange, like something from the future or the past, maybe. Lycus checked it and slung it across his back. Then he lifted out a handgun. Cannon, I thought. It's long and looks heavy, it's old too and worn, like the rifle. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. Almost as strange as the fallen guns, but obviously made for a human. Lycus looked it over and dropped it into a holster on his hip, patted it once or twice. I looked around. Only Buras looked unsurprised. He turned to us then and walked down the line we'd unintentionally made. Buras, Liam, Jenna, Ryman, Seb, Lana, Pilo, me. Checking straps and gear, patting shoulders and touching hands. When he came to me, he took both of my upper arms in his hands and leaned close. I could just about see his eyes in the shadow of his hood. He stared at me. I saw something then. Some spark of energy dancing in his eyes. Light. He nodded briskly, span on his heel smartly, and let us out. We moved quickly. Lycus has set a brisk pace. Jenna and Liam are scouting ahead, making sure the path is clear for us. After last night, we're not taking any chances. Pillow walks closer to me. Ryman and Seb follow us. Lana and Buras bring up the rear. The sun is cresting the horizon behind us, and our shadows stretch out before us, climbing up rises and scrambling over ancient rubble. The path isn't as hard going as the one Pilo and I followed yesterday. Lycus has chosen a more roundabout way. It'll take longer, but we'll come out onto the old street, right in front of the Jean Cinch building. Part of me worries about what we will find. Part of me is excited. That worries me more. I think about the fallen, scavengers, like has called them, pirates. What made them that way? I wish I'd asked about their planet. They wanted it back, the traveller. Must mean that they had it before. Did they capture it? Did it come to them? Were they like us once? Did it betray them too? I don't want to visit the traveller, wherever it is. No one's sure what happened after the old world ended. Gamma has a story, though, about a city, a city that was built beneath the Traveller. For all that I hate, no fear, the Traveller. It sounds like a paradise, an oasis in the ruined desert of Earth. Maybe if the Traveller is real, that city is real too. I think about the picture in the beautiful room, the happiness of it. I think Lycus might be able to change my mind about seeing the Traveller, just so I can visit the city. Tap, tap, tap. The fallen weapon at my hip, reminding me that I've killed it to get it. You did the right thing. Really. What did I gain from ending those lives? A new gun? Is that it? A life for a weapon? They might have killed you. They would have killed me, so Lycus says. But does that mean it's okay for me to kill them? Pilo fired first. Horrible thought. It's not okay just because Pilo did it. What would Mama think? What would Gamma say? They're not here. They weren't there. Kill, Gamma had said. Hunt. There is honour in this. Honour in killing to feed, she meant. What about to protect? What if those things ever found a way into the underground? Would you kill them to save Rico, Mama, Gamma? Yes, of course. Then why not Pilo? Why not yourself? There is heat at my back, hotter than before. Ghost. Is it speaking to me? Are these my thoughts or its? What is happening to me? In front of me, Lycus stops, raises his fist into the air, quickly finger signs, ready. I look past him. We've been walking down a street lined with ruined buildings. Another 50 feet away are the familiar flagstones, the strange family logo of the Gene Cinch building. We're there. Our pace slows to a crawl for the next few yards. Jenna and Liam are crouched down behind the rubble that has fallen across the street. We make our way to them and Lycus signals for everyone to get down. I crouch next to Pilo. He looks at me. Finger signs. Okay. I sign yes back. 
We look into one another's eyes. There's something in there, something like fire, more light. It's hard to look away. Lycus gathers us closer, uses hand sign to assign positions. We're going to split up. Clearly Lycus wants to be careful about how we approach. Maybe he suspects something. The old hunter wants me and Pilo to go right with Liam and Jenna. We're going to be furthest from the entrance to the building, I realise. Lycus and the rest will head down the left side. They'll enter first. We'll provide backup. He's protecting me, I think. I don't know why. I'm nothing special. Again, the heat. Aren't you? The ghost. Everyone signals ready. Checks over the weapons. Pilo puts his hand on my shoulder. I place my hand on his. Squeeze. Go. We move immediately on Lycus's signal. Pilo takes the lead of our little group. Jenna follows, then me, then Liam. I watch Lycus scurry around the corner of the wreckage that litters the street, holding his long rifle in one hand. He's fast. The others struggle to keep up. We dart between cover, making our way steadily up the right-hand side of the wide avenue. When we're almost exactly across from the Jean Cinch building, Pilo signals us to stop. He hand signs further instructions to Liam and Jenna. The pair head up for the cover of a doorway further up the street, in the last building before the forest. Pilo waves for me to stay where I am. I watch the front of the building. Lycus has entered already. The others follow him in. Ryman and Seb take up positions on either side of the wide door. Then we wait. Minutes feel like hours. Tense, nervous. Sweat coats my palms. I'm glad I'm wearing gloves. Pilo and I were very specific about the layout of the building, about where our encounter with the fallen took place. There's no way Lycas got lost. Maybe it was a trap. But who'd want to trap us? Who'd know we would be coming back? I'm worried now. They've been too long. I can see Pilo getting restless, little movements of his body, the way he keeps adjusting his position slightly, give him away. He checks his gun again every minute. I don't think I've ever seen him so agitated. I manage to get his attention, finger sign, okay? He waves his hand in a not so subtle gesture of annoyance. Annoyed at me? No. He knows Lycus has been too long. He's worried too. Pilo shakes his head. Looks like he's trying to shake out a thought or two. I know how he feels. Just as I'm about to sign over to suggest that we go in ourselves, Lycus steps into the doorway. He must have skirted the open area in the atrium and approached the door from one of the long, pillared galleries stretching down either side. He waves openly. Pilo waves back, motions for us to follow. As we cross the street, I can see Ryman signing to Lycus. Lycus puts his hand on Ryman's, shakes his head. I pass Lycus as I enter the building, but he doesn't look at me. Seb is looking a little put out. Ryman looks less than impressed. The rest of us gather to the right of the door. I don't know why, but I want to be at the back, as far from Lycus as possible. But I want to be near Pilo, and he's at the front. I shuffle until I'm just behind him. I feel a little better. Buras and Lana descend the stairs nearby, walk over to us. Anything? Lycus asks. Buras shakes his head, darts a quick look at Pilo and me. I feel Pilo tense. Lycus strokes his chin. There were tracks, Lana says. Mixed up, though. Drag marks. Seems to be after the scuffle. Scuffle? A flash of anger. I go to speak. Pilo cuts me off with a gesture. Are the fallen, he asks. Lana nods. We think so, she says. Lycus turns to Buras. What do you think, old friend? Buras considers for a moment. He clenches and unclenches his fists. Definitely fallen. Signs point to them coming and going again. The amount of blood and ether up there. The fallen they killed. Buras flips his hand towards Pilo and me. Wouldn't even have gotten up again, much less fled. Must have been others. Lycus folds his arms. They took the bodies? Direction? Uncertain. Something's wrong here. Lycus begins to pace. No one speaks. Seb nudges Ryman, but his teacher shushes him. 
Seb pushes himself forward as Lycus passes. Could be a trap. His voice is very loud. Lycus turns and looks at him. There's something angry in the darkness of his hood. He knows that already, idiot. He knew it before we left the station. Seb backs away from the old hunter, eyes down. Raman cuffs him across the back of the head. I feel my lips twitch into a smile. I can't help it. Look at Pirlo to hide it from the others. He's smiling too. Lycus resumes pacing for a moment, then turns to look straight at Pirlo. Let's take a look at this machine. A blue light darts across the open street, hits Alana squarely in the middle of her face as she's walking out of the doorway. Her head just seems to disappear. She takes another step, then her body just collapses. Someone's screaming. Pillow shoves me back towards the wall. We're just inside the door on the right-hand side. My view is obscured, but I can make out Ryman and Seb pulling Jenna out of the way, back into cover. Buras, Alikas, and Liam were close behind Alana as she led the way out. Buras has lurched towards Pilo and me. He's on the floor but not hurt. I can hear Lycus shouting something to Liam. They must be taking cover amidst the rubble outside. There's a familiar scream, the fallen. Seb was right. Didn't Lycus know it was a trap? He must have done. So how did we get caught in it? Covering fire, I hear shots ring out, quite unlike anything I've ever heard. Lycus's rifle. It must be. I don't realise the fallen have been firing until I can't hear their weapons. Buras is on one knee. He leans around the door and begins firing. Pilo leans out over him, firing, reloading, firing. I edge around Pilo and glance outside. One of the fallen are already dead. The corpse is lying in a pool of blood on the other side of the street. Lycus is crouched behind a decorative wall near the entrance of the building. Liam is a few feet away from him, huddled near a large lump of concrete. The hunters seem to be firing across the street, towards the building's upper floors. The fallen were hiding there when we arrived. Why would they come back? For the ghost? The machine? Maybe we surprise them. Lycus's magazine runs out. He drops back behind his cover. Pilo, Buras, and Liam keep firing. The fallen notice the lull. One or two appear in the empty window frames, strange guns barking out blue bullets. Movement to my left. Ryman is at the door, shooting with the rest. Seb has been trying to calm Jenna, but she shrugged him off. Now Seb is on the floor, his hand pressed to his face. Jenna's hand goes to the fallen weapon in its improvised holster. She draws it as she runs towards the door. I swing my rifle up and around, following her, past her. I take aim at the windows across the street and fire. Jenna is on the steps, firing as she goes. I see another fallen drop. Jenna, like as calls. She's down the steps, still running. A forearm, much bigger than the one Pilo and me killed yesterday, appears in the doorway of the building, an enormous shotgun-like thing in its hands. Takes aim, waits until Jenna is close enough, Fires. She staggers. Falls. I sight down the scope. The forearm is a giant. It's wearing heavy armor. The helmet looks like a nest of metal plates and horns. A long red cape trails from its shoulders. I fire. The recoil spoils my view, but I know the shot has hit. I bring the rifle back down, sight on the forearm again. My round has done nothing. The giant darts back into the safety of the doorway. I drop to a crouch, take aim again. A shot from the windows hits the floor near me. I adjust my aim, find a fallen two-arm up there and fire. The shot hits. Fluid and white gas-like substance spout from its ruined head. I see another fallen, one of the smaller forearms, I think, raising its weapon. It's pointing right at me. I roll out of the way, crash into Pila and Buras. I bolt upright. I'm safe behind the wall again. Pilo gets up, but Buras looks hurt. I grab his arm. Help him heave himself into a crouch. He winces and quickly rubs his ankle. I must have hit it when we collided. I start to crouch down to him. None of that, he shouts. They need cover. He shoves me back to the doorway. Seb's crouching next to Ryman. Pilo's to my right. Lycus and Liam haven't moved from their cover. They're all still firing. Some shots ping off the concrete around the doorway. Others disappear into the windows. The fallen seem to have dropped back. 
Lycus puts his hand up, signals stop. We stop shooting, but everyone keeps their guns up. The quiet is so loud. There's no noise. I can hear my heart beat in my ears. I peer carefully outside. Lana's body is lying only a few feet away from us, sprawled across several steps. Jenna's is face down in the street. Blood pools under her. I feel bile rise in my throat. It burns. I turn and spit. Seba drops to his knees, begins retching. Ryman lowers his weapon, bends over his apprentice, pats him gently on the back. I see Lycus and Lyme gesturing to one another. They're signing so fast I'm having difficulty keeping up, but I get the idea. Liam's going to get Jenna. The hunter slings his rifle onto his back, draws his fallen pistol. Pilo nudges me, hand signs instructions. We carefully emerge from the doorway, keeping low. Pilo leads the way to the cover near Lycus. I follow, drop into the curve of the low wall near the top of the steps. Lycus looks across at us, nods, then looks back at Liam. He's halfway to Jenna now. Movement, there, in the windows, Lycus snaps his rifle up and fires. I see a puff of white and spurt of dark blood. I thought Pilo was fast. Liam stops in his tracks, looks over his shoulder at us. Suddenly, the huge forearm lopes from the doorway, screaming, firing his brutal weapon. Liam flies backwards, his chest is on fire. A spray of blood droplets sparkles in the air. Lycus fires again. The shot seems to disappear into a blue haze around the giant. More fallen appear at the windows. Peeler and I raise our weapons and begin firing. A smaller forearm dies from a second floor window, rolls as it hits the ground. Three shots, one mine, hits its chest, caving it in. Lycus fires again at the fallen giant. It blurs and seems to vanish for a second, reappearing several yards from where it was. Lycus seems to know this trick though, and his next shot snaps its head back. I lose the giant behind a mound of rubble, take aim at a two-arm in one of the windows. Kill it. I close my eyes, feel Pilo close by. The world seems to slow. He's lost sight of the giant too. In the doorway, my eyes snap open, a two-arm, pistol raised. Pilo's moving my way, trying to get sight on the enormous fallen. He hasn't seen the danger. I jump as the two-arm fires. Pilo doesn't even turn. I watch as the blue bolt floats lazily towards him. Lycus fires the two-arm. The noise of his rifle is astonishingly loud. The sound echoes and rings, claps and booms. I'm going to make it. Suddenly, at the nape of my neck, the ward begins to burn. My body twists in the air, though I'm not sure it's me who's doing it. In my mind's eye, I can see the shape of the armor beneath my coat. A barely noticeable bulge indicates a thicker section. The plates must have slipped some time in the fight. Lucky me, I think. As the bolt gets closer, I can see the webs of electricity jumping and pulsing around it. Faint white lines traced dragged patterns across the surface. It's warm, but it's cold warmth, bitter and hard. I shut my eyes. An interlude in destruction. He watched the arc bolt smack into her stomach, a crack of electricity briefly fitted over her armour. Her coat steamed where it hit, but she was alive. He could see her light, still strong but fading fast. Lycus Wolf's blood, the white mane, hunter, guardian, roared in anguish. The drag in the doorway had already crumpled to the ground, ether gushing from its ruptured body before she'd fallen into Pilo's lap. The young hunter scooped her up, pulled her into her cover, fingers brushing aside her short hair. She cut it, Lycus thought to himself. I hadn't noticed. He turned his attention back to the fight. He'd been in many before, of course. He died countless times in the name of the Traveller, for the protection of the city and the people within. His ghost had found him centuries ago, buried in the rubble of a Czech condominium. His arms had been wrapped around the body of a woman, his wife. He couldn't remember, and his ghost, the strange little machine that had the power to give life to the dead, had told him to let go. But letting go was hard. He still saw her face, even now. She'd been long gone, but he traced the line of her skull, followed the ragged scraps of skin and sinew still clinging to one cheek, and somehow seen who she had been. 
The girl looked a little like her. He'd seen her once before, the girl. Losev had showed Lycus his little babe when they returned to the underground after a hunt, had twirled around with her in his arms, reveling in her twinkling laughter, light and love blooming around them. Losev hadn't been the first, but Lycus missed him most. Lycus had found others before, others whose light seemed bright enough to serve the traveller, who he could take back to the city in hopes of redeeming himself. Look, he'd say, I found a new guardian, one not dead like us, but with life and memories and bright ties to this world that we could only dream of having. He'd be given an audience with the speaker, presented with a new ghost. He could be the white mane again, but Losef, like all the others, had died on a hunt. The fallen devils had come back to London, searching for something to aid them in their fight against humanity. Lycus didn't know what, didn't much care. He knew that his task, the task he'd set himself when he fled the tower, when he came to scratch out a life in the European dead zone. No friends, no ghost, no hope. His task wasn't to hunt the fallen, but he did anyway. He chose hunting grounds that would lead them into close proximity with the four armed aliens, and in his hubris thought his companions would be strong enough to stand up to them. He trained them after all, but they never were. Losef had died. Losef had died and Lucas had brought his body back to the underground. They'd taken off his coat and his boots, taken off the charm he wore on a thin string around his neck. They'd laid him on a pyre in one of the deep, dark tunnels and watched as he burned. Then he found a pillow. Pillow had so much light. He was brimming with it, but it was unfocused, somehow surrounding him like a cloud, not firm and sharp like Losef's, like hers. Her light was like a weapon, a brilliant dagger deep within, and when Lycus saw her again that day, after her first hunt, he knew she was the one he'd take back. She was his prize. And now she was dying. That brilliant sliver of light expanding outward, blurring. The edges of the bright weapon blunted. There were four fallen left now. Two vandals in the building firing at the doorway. A lone dreg had followed the other out the door. Stood there with his pistol raised, a knife in his other hand. The captain waited, shrapnel launcher and shock blade at the ready, staring straight at him. Behind his eyes, Lycus felt an awakening. He looked within himself and saw the smoldering pile that had once been his fount of light begin to glow. Years and years of practice had hidden his traveller given talent deeply. He put up walls to protect himself from the temptation of its use, thrown down barriers to block the bitter memories of such awesome power. But the light bulged and pressed up against him, broke through, and like a tidal wave began to race down the avenues of his mind, latching onto synapses and suffusing his thoughts with a golden glow, coursing through veins and capillaries, filling his body with fierce heat and magnificent light. He gasped and clenched his fist. Concentrate. Don't fight it. Use it. Lycus focused on a speck of light, drew a line in his mind for it to follow, pushed it and pulled it down from his chest, across his forearm and into his fist. The first was followed by a second. A channel was opened. More light was drawn down, Lycus's will bending it to his designs. Like a pebble falling before the avalanche, the single grain showed the others the way. The channel was overwhelmed and Lycus screamed with the effort of control. His mind formed a shape, a gun. Another, the bullet. He felt the immense weight of it in his hand but found that he could bear it. His mind's eye opened onto the world. He saw it through a yellow haze. There was a weapon in his hand where none had been before. The captain was advancing, towering over him. Vandals in the windows, firing. Dragged by the open door, waiting. He drew the bullet into the gun with his mind, raised it, fired. A vandal dropped, screeching. Another bullet formed itself in his light, constructed itself within the chamber of the golden gun. Lycus fired again, and the other vandal's head popped. The captain blurred and shifted, reappearing back by a tall lump of concrete near the building. He fired. Lycus jumped, felt the passage of exploding shrapnel beneath him raised the gun and dredged every speck of light left in him, brought it to bear on his target. The bullet was made. He waited until he could see nothing but the captain's plate-covered head, 
before pulling the trigger. Fire engulfed the fallen captain. The light cracked open the armoured helmet, exposed the wrinkled pulpy flesh beneath for a moment before it, too, tore and billowed outward in an explosion of viscera, bone and teeth, blood and spittle, clouds of precious ether. Lycas sailed over the still-standing corpse, pulled the rune-carved knife from its sheath on its hip, and landed softly, directly before the lone dreg. The creature snarled, sharp teeth bared, a guttural sound churning through its throat. Lycas' vision blurred as the very last engram of light burned up in his mind, and he lazily thrust the blade into the beast's head, twisted, pulled. It was over.